What happened here in this place to all the people that were on top? Eliezer Ben Yair, after the wall was lit on fire and they knew the Romans were coming in to have their 48 hours of fun, <laughs> that he got the people together, at least the elders of the place, and he gave a speech. Now, the speech that he gave was recorded by Josephus. It's right towards the end of the book, The Wars of the Jews, and you can read it. But the survivors of Masada were two women and five children and they were down in one of the cisterns. So they related this information to someone who got it to Josephus and he wrote it down. So you have to take the exact wording with a grain of salt. But the concept was something else. First of all, understand these people that were up here. They were zealots. They were more than zealots, they were Sicarii, which means that they were assassins. They used daggers and they were the Jewish I hate to put it this way, so please forgive me. I don't mean anything horrible by it, but they were basically the Jewish equivalent of ISIS. They even killed people that they thought collaborated with the Romans. They hated the Romans. Now Jerusalem is gone. They're up here and they're surrounded. The Romans are about ready to break through the casemate wall. It's on fire. And Eleazar gets people together, probably right here, right here. And he gives them whatever speech he gave them, that which is recorded or a variation of it, that said this. Rather than being taken slaves, they're going to kill all the men, they're going to take the women and they're going to do whatever they're going to do with them and the children and enslave them. But rather than being murdered by the Romans and enslaved by them, let's all die. That was the resolution and they agreed to it. A kosher butcher was brought forward. He taught the fathers how to mercifully kill their wives and children. They did so, they went back to the houses and they laid them out neatly and orderly. It was not chaos. It was to show the Romans that we intended to do this. It was not suicide. So the fathers killed their families. They came back here. Ten men were chosen to kill everyone else. And then of those who were here, that the ten that were left, they had those shards of pottery that you saw in the movie, the Astruca, which with their names on it. They put it in a jar. They take one out. The one whose name is on that kills the other nine and then falls on his own sword. Everybody's dead. In the movie, which was actually quite interesting, Peter O'Toole plays Flavius Silva, the commander of the 10th Roman Legion. And when he finally gets up here on top of Masada via the ramp, which he really did, we don't know whether he said this or whether it's a Hollywoodism, but it was a brilliant statement. When one of his centurions comes up to him after building a monument out of armor and what have you, even though the Jews had burned all the weapons to make sure the Romans didn't get them, left all the warehouses full so that they knew that during the siege they weren't being starved to death that they build this monument and to, uh, to the Roman victory. And he says, we have a monument to our victory over here. And Flavius Silva just stares off into the distance. And he says, what have we won except the top of a rock in a wasteland and the shores of a poison sea? And that's the truth of the matter. This was a Roman defeat and it was recorded. And it's extremely rare, but it's not recorded as a defeat. It was just that they didn't win. But it is an astonishing thing that it ever made it down onto papyrus. Needless to say, this place right here is where that began to unwind. And this place right here, um, I get asked frequently, what is my favorite place in all of Israel? And I have to say it's right here. And yet it's not even a site that's in the Bible. What's interesting is that the Bible was found in this site. There's a gentleman in this room, you just saw him, he's a scribe, he's an orthodox Jew, he's a scribe, he's a great guy. And he works in here, but before he turned this into a scriptorium where he's actually scribing Torah scrolls, and he might even do your name, I don't know, but he's in here. This was the ark, this is where they kept the storage area for the scrolls, but in every synagogue of that time, there was also a small chamber called a Genitza. The Genitza was a place where you put damaged scrolls until you could mercifully, properly bury them or destroy them because they were damaged and the Word of God must remain undamaged, it must remain complete. So as the scroll began to wear out, they treated it like a person. They didn't treat it like, like a worn out Bible and maybe trash it or something. It's terrible. In their minds that is un unthinkable. Yigal Yadin, in the second season of his excavations here, 60, 68 and 69, is looking for the Genitza here. And this is nothing but rubble. He finds it. Now remember, the benches you are sitting on here are original. Look at the line. These are original. The Genitza was in here. It was underground. 
And what he found was very interesting. He was expecting to find a chamber. Instead, he begins to find where he thinks is a Ganitsa, but it's packed with dried material, dirt and rocks. And as he begins to unlayer it like a good archaeologist, he finds that dirt had been placed in there and stomped down and placed more and stomped down. Something was in there and they were packing dirt on top of it. He begins to remove the dirt and he finds two things. He finds the damaged Deuteronomy scroll that is in horrendously bad condition. Scrolls were not very big sometimes, they were small. And then he finds another scroll, a scroll that is in a unique condition because it's not rolled up and smashed. It's opened and laid flat and it's under all this dirt. I actually saw the scroll in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's open and laid flat. It's not very big. It's only about that tall. It's about that big. It's an Essene scroll. It's called a pseudo-Ezekiel scroll, which means that they had added some things to it to fit their, their, um, uh, their community and, and what have you. But all in all, this passage was completely intact from the Hebrew Bible. And it's laying flat and facing up. What, after reading it, he didn't conclude this. He was a secularist. He didn't care. It's in one chapter, actually one portion of one chapter of his book on the excavation of Masada. You can read it yourself. But it's not of no real importance to him as far as the content goes. To me, it makes it the most, this the most important site in Israel for me personally. What he found face up, apparently either a message through time or set in such a way where God in heaven would look down and be able to read it and remember. He found this. Are you ready? I'll tell you where it is in a minute. This is what it said. This exists. It was found in there. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, suddenly a, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I, looked, uh, uh, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came on them, and the skin covered the, over them, but there was no breath in them. So he also said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves, and cause you to come up from your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel, and then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I performed it, says the Lord. The fall of this place was the fall of Israel nationally until now, 1948. And now we're reading the same passage of Scripture that presumably on that night somebody buried and packed with earth in there to send a message to the Lord, don't forget us. And now, here we are in Israel. That's why I love this place. So, welcome to Masada.